Welcome to the Commonwealth Club. I'm George Hammond, Chair of the Humanities Forum, which organized today's event. I'd like to welcome our online audiences to enjoy another one of our virtual programs that are arranged by our fantastic tech staff at the Commonwealth Club. Um, and I hope that uh, those of you who see it live stream now or those who watch it later uh, will get another idea uh, and a very interesting one about corruption in America. Uh, we have Sarah Chase with us today um, speaking about her book, Corruption in America. And uh, one of the things that I, I wanted to say uh, in, in intro, uh, Sarah, was, you know, this should be a very popular program. I'm not sure how many are going to watch to understand how to fix the problem. I'm afraid we might have quite a few that think it's a how to do it uh, program. Um, and that will boost the, uh, the interest. <laughs> Um, but one of the things that you said in your book uh, that I found interesting, you, you, you contrasted uh, Joseph Kennedy and, and, and Roosevelt, and we'll get to them later. But you mentioned that Roosevelt spoke at the Commonwealth Club in 1932 and that he mentioned a, a different way of approaching this, not just in terms of building and creating an economy, but uh, knowing how to distribute what's, what's being created. And so I thought that was a great uh, idea uh, to set us up. And the other thing is uh, that you started with a large number of points from ancient history. Uh, you talked about this, the myth of Midas, which I was not expecting, um, but, but I love the way you connected it to, to coinage and democracy. So why don't you tell us a little bit about why the myth of Midas uh, sits at the base of your, your talking about corruption? Thank you very much, George, for, for that question, first of all. And, and again, I'd just like to add my own thanks to everyone who is listening and watching online now or in the future, I mean, people's lives are tough at the moment. And, you know, to give an hour for a conversation like this is, if anything, even more of a gift to us and to our community um, than it might have been before this pandemic. And so we both, I'm sure, George and I both regret not being in a room with you and able to interact with you, um, but we're with you in spirit. Um, yeah. And, you know, it came, the word myth has come to have a kind of um, a negative meaning in contemporary English, right? We use it as a synonym for something that's not true and that only stupid people believe, right? Mm -hmm. That's not what myth is. Myth is actually one of the deepest ways of gaining insights into the human condition at all times. I mean, the, the, the teaching in myth is so deep um, that, it, that it really is relevant in a timeless way. And so I sort of feel as though because we have turned our back on myth as a source of education, as a source of thought about ourselves, we are being obliged to live it in the flesh. I mean, if you look at some of the figures who are striding across the stage of, of our world today, I mean, you, they're as exaggerated as any figure in, <laughs> in, you know, in Greek myth. And so I thought, well, let's go back. What does myth have to say about this? And for me, the root of corruption is um, an unbridled uh, quest for money. It's really, that's at the root of it. So I thought, well, what are the stories? What are the sacred stories about money? And the first thing I thought of, of course, was Midas. And Midas, what's stunning about Midas is, I mean, the meaning of the myth really is not just the guy was greedy and he would have starved to death, um, but it's that this was the one wish he had was essentially infinite wealth, right? And what that gift did was transform everything he held dear, everything that had a kind of, I want to say, intrinsic and irreplaceable value. Hawthorne does a, a, a version of it for kids in which he gives Midas a daughter. Now imagine, he's all upset realizing how dangerous this gift is he's asked for. His daughter comes running to comfort him. He kisses his daughter on the forehead and she turns into metal. Metal he can, you know, exchange at market. But that irreplaceable human being and relationship is gone. Mm -hmm. It turns out what I love doing when I look at myth is intersecting myth or sacred story with 
science, you know, history, archaeology. Turns out there was a Midas. And it mm -hmm. turns out, guess what? He lived right about when and where money was invented. And money, as Aristotle, and we get to Aristotle, as Aristotle discovered when he started thinking about it, is a completely revolutionary, a new way of storing and transferring value. And it leads precisely to this type of race with no finish line, mm -hmm. where it's no longer what you need to have a decent standard of living, a decent livelihood, a human existence, a commonwealth, but rather it becomes the measure of social value. Mm -hmm. And once it's the measure of social value, it becomes a race with no finish line for, you know, in the Midas story, gold. But in fact, it wasn't gold. money, which is coins. Today, it's not even money. It's mm -hmm. zeros. Zeros it's in bank accounts. Yeah. And we are converting everything that is of irreplaceable intrinsic value, both on the planet that we have the good fortune, fortune to inhabit, and in our human societies and creativity and labor and you name it, right? We are in a race to convert that to zeros. And that way lies utter devastation. That's really the story of the myth. And, and, and so in a way you can say that Midas caught the Midas disease. And I really think right. that's the heart of this story. Who's got the Midas disease? They are dangerous to their society and to the planet as a whole. They are incredibly dangerous because their fundamental objective is to turn everything we care about into zeros. So how bad do we have the Midas disease today? Well, let's look at our language. What does the Midas touch mean in today's American English? Gold faucets in your house. <laughs> right, but it's fundamentally something positive, right? Oh, he's got oh. the finest touch, isn't he lucky? Yeah. It's... I mean, we may not feel, you may not feel about it that way, right. but you know, when Donald Trump writes a book that says, that's called the Midas touch, why entrepreneurs, some entrepreneurs get rich and most don't, what he's right. saying is the Midas touch is a wonderful thing. And that should tell us something very significant, not only about Donald Trump, but about our society as a whole, that that kind of a title could have passed unnoticed. We don't realize the Midas touch is a devastating curse. So that's why I started there. Yeah, you have a nice story about uh, uh, Australian uh, initiation ceremony where the boys, uh, when they become adult men, find out what the, what the lie is that allows them to get the, not the Midas touch, but to become an adult in their society. And I, I thought that was a very nice analogy for this. People might call it the Midas touch, but they don't, they don't reveal to everybody else that how they accomplish this is through corruption. Right. That's a separate story which has to do with secrecy. And it has to do, that has to do with how the people sick with the Midas disease band together into coalitions um, and basically keep the majority down or certainly fight back against potential or real opposition to their capture of the, of the politics and the economy of a country. And they do one of their most important tools is precisely secrecy and initiation into the secret and the secret which may, may not actually be something, but it certainly is secrecy as a way of excluding the uninitiated. And it was interesting because I start that section with my own experience with being inducted into our, you know, uh, uh, secret society, which is to say a top secret security clearance. Mm -hmm. And it was one of the most traumatic experiences I've ever been through, because essentially what they do is mimic being in the electric chair. And it's absolutely terrifying to anybody who has a, a sort of normally constituted, you know, nervous system. Yeah. And that's kind of the initiation right. And then I discovered once inside that you know, half of the stuff that is exchanged on top secret, you know, um, computer systems and things like that is a bunch of nonsense. I mean, there's nothing to it. It's not secret. If, if only all the people that wanted to join this corrupt network at the top of our society went to a couple of the boring parties that they go to, I think they would change their minds too. You know, I mean, there's there's all kinds of nonsense 
that goes on. Um, I've, I've taken my daughters to, to a couple of uh, experiences a little like that to let them know that everybody talks about this stuff, but it really is a bunch of old men doing boring stuff. That's <laughs> right. And so I think that's a really important feature. But the other feature is how effectively some of these folks have deployed secrecy. Um, and then they use, a, you know, so you have literally almost occult um, organizations that are part of these networks. But then you also have things like the cloak of invisibility that is conferred by respectable sounding institutions like the U.S. Chamber of Commerce. You know, it seems very blue chip and respectable. But in fact, when you start looking at what causes top Chamber of Commerce companies have been furthering, uh, and what organizations they are giving their money to, you start to understand that they actually have a very anti-democratic um, and anti-egalitarian um, agenda. And then the other very important aspect of secrecy, which is, again, a tool deployed by the corrupt against us, mm -hmm. um, or corrupt ruling networks, if you will. The other thing that's incredibly important is disinformation and misinformation which we're all living with a lot of right now. And mm -hmm. often the objective of those tactics is not so much necessarily to convince people that lies are true, but rather to confuse everybody. Yeah. So, you know, one example that I found really striking of that was the sugar industry, which knew decades and decades and decades ago that sugar is essentially toxic. Mm -hmm. They didn't ever lie and say, no, actually, sugar is good for you. But what they did was wave a flag, you know, at fat and say, oh, everybody, fat is what's really, really, really dangerous. So let's, you know, all get worried about fat. And so everyone was really worried about fat for decades until relatively recently with diabetes studies and things like that. We're coming to understand how very dangerous sugar is. That's, you know, another way of playing with secrecy. Yeah, like like a magician that says, look over here. Yeah, 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 exactly. Yeah. And and uh, that brings me to something else. You, you mentioned the cloak of invisibility, so I'm going to use that you evoked it. When you said that people aren't aware of myth, but people would not think of Harry Potter as a myth, for example, this story. But it basically works as a myth. Yeah. It, there's, it's not really about magic. It's about how do you deal with evil? How do you how do you deal with growing up? How do you, you know, there's all kinds of uh, storylines in there, and, and none of it is directly applicable because none of us are, are wizards or, or, or witches. Um, but it's there to tell a story in an emotionally powerful way. To go to another myth uh, that you talk about near the beginning, which you use very well at the end as well, the, the uh, story of the Hydra. Mm. Uh, and you use it quite often. Hercules has to kill this Hydra. It's not an easy thing to do because every time you cut off a head, two more sprout. Um, but you, you located the, uh, the Hydra too. So why don't you tell us a little bit about that, that part of your so imagery. what's incredibly important about the Hydra as an analogy or a metaphor for what I'm talking about is I think that too often in the United States, when we think about corruption, we think about venal acts by individuals. And in fact, I start the book with one example of that, which is mm -hmm. frankly a two-bit corruption case that was only important because the Supreme Court overturned the conviction of the mm. corrupt politician who had been, at the time he did what he did, he had been the governor of Virginia. And that was a, it was a very important moment because the Supreme Court overturned his conviction eight to zero. It was a unanimous decision overturning right. a unanimous uh, conviction of the guy. And the Supreme Court in, his, in its opinion explicitly downgraded corruption in exactly those terms as mm -hmm. just basically tawdry tales of Rolexes and, and, you know, Ferraris and who really cares, right? And unfortunately, I think that that is how corruption is often framed in this country. I didn't start thinking about corruption in the United States. I started thinking about it in Afghanistan, where my neighbors right. were just, you know, coming. I lived in downtown Kandahar, and I'm watching the Taliban kind of seep back in, and my neighbors are coming beside themselves about corruption. I didn't intend to focus on corruption in any way, shape, or form. It was my Afghan neighbors who forced me to focus on it 
and caused me to understand that people were returning to the Taliban not because of some religious extremist ideology, but because of their irritation and corruption, or indignation, rather. And then I spent basically 10 years looking at that, at that proposition and discovered that it was true all around the world. So while the Supreme Court was saying corruption doesn't really matter, it's just a Rolex here and there, and we shouldn't be bothered with it, I had come to the conclusion that corruption lies at the root of almost every significant crisis that besets the world today. And so, and sure enough, that decision came down at the end of June 2016. So within weeks, the entire political landscape had been completely thrown on its ear mm -hmm. by the issue of corruption. So the Supreme Court got that completely wrong. Why I use the Hydra is that it explains what the Supreme Court got wrong. The Supreme mm. Court was talking about Governor McDonald's um, acts as though they were, you know, the individual transgressions of one lone venal guy. That's right. not how it works. Corruption is, in fact, closer to the operating system of a very sophisticated or very sophisticated networks that interweave the all sorts of sectors that we have a tendency to consider separately, like mm -hmm. private and public sector, right? And so again, we have an expression which is the revolving door. But that again implies that one individual is pushing a door from one sector to another. That's not how it works. You've got mm -hmm. folks that are going back and forth and back and forth between the Fed and BlackRock money managers and then back to Treasury and then back to some other Goldman Sachs. And then, you know, you have a profound interweaving yes. of these networks across the different sectors. And then what that means is they can afford to lose a head or two, just like the Hydra. At worst, if they have to sacrifice a head, they can and then they regenerate another one. But by just focusing attention, as so many, unfortunately, anti-corruption anti activists do, on the one person at the top, be it, you know, President Park in South Korea, or, right. you know, I mean, I There's can go the bad on, one on, on. Good, good <laughs> luck, Jonathan, in, in Nigeria, or Donald Trump, or Hillary Clinton, you know, depending on which side of the aisle you sit on in this country, you're missing the point. Yeah. You are. And the, one of the nice things uh, you did, um, a very, very personal note, um, and, and I, there's this Afghanistan connection too, but you, you talk about Aristotle and how Aristotle made a distinction between getting something, a, a prize of value that shows that your contribution to your society is highly prized, I guess, if the Nobel Prize came without any money, that would be that kind of thing, you know, um, uh, so that you know what's really valuable and that there's a distinction between that and just getting money and being paid for it. And, uh, and your, your analogy was uh, that you said that you built a, a particular uh, piece for your cabin uh, with a friend of yours named Sebastian. And then uh, later on, you, you mentioned Sebastian Younger a couple of times. So I assume that that's the Sebastian who did it. And, and you said that you've known him since you're four years old. So I find it ironic that you, you met at four years old. You both have written about Afghanistan because that's one that, where he went to. Did you go? You didn't go. How did this happen? That's well, you don't even start. I mean, don't even, <laughs> don't start. even start. It is so bizarre. We keep intersecting. Our professional lives keep intersecting without knowing about it. So, yes, we both ended up in Afghanistan in completely different ways. I mean, right. He did come and visit me when I was there, but he got there completely separately. Yeah. Um, and then the Gilded Age, I mean, he literally came to visit me and we worked on that, on that counter mm -hmm. when I was struggling with my Gilded Age chapter. And yeah. it turns out that he was working on the other side of the Gilded Age, which was the protest movements. And the, and the anarchist movement. And that frankly is what caused me to give that so much room uh -huh. uh, later on in the book. And now we're both working on Nomad. I mean, it's just ridiculous. So but I you met when you were four, you said, right? 
Sorry? You met when you were four? I mean, did you grow up three, in the same place? Three. No, four. Yeah. You're correct. Four. Four. Did you grow up in the same town or your parents knew no, each other? No, but or? we went to school together. And for went some reason, we hit it off and we've never stopped being friends. And I've heard that um, they, they, scientists have actually, we're getting down a rabbit hole here, George, but scientists have actually um, assayed the DNA of close friends. And it turns uh -huh. out that they often are found to share a remarkable amount of DNA, even if they're not related. And uh -huh. so I kind of figure that's got to be what's going on here, because, <laughs> I mean, we keep coming to the same topics and subjects from different angles um, well, without knowing to... that each other is working on it. And so that's been incredibly enriching, I have to say. I was going to say, it must have been great to grow up with somebody who is also a writer personality. Because that doesn't happen a lot in school. You know, if you're a writer personality, you might be the only one. But here you have your best friend is another person who, who has the personality to be a, a re writer. And uh, as you mentioned in your book, he approaches it from a different angle, but with a, pretty much the same emotional um, I agreement. I think so. With you and even that. intellectual, you know, and we share so much intellectual. I mean, we're always passing resources to each other. And so we have definitely fertilized each other's thinking. Um, what I would say, we also have John Valiant, if anyone in the audience uh, has ever read his book. The, he just wrote, or wrote one a few years ago called the, uh, Something About the Tiger. Mm -hmm. um, so we were actually three you know, active writers in a very small class. But interestingly, we only developed into writers way after we were in that school. But right. this is way more personal history than anyone needs. <laughs> very, very interesting. Now, so one other thing from the past to cover is that you you draw on some of the things that Jesus approached. I mean, you, you yeah. bring up this story of how he, he goes in and he, he, he kicks the, the uh, money changers out of the temple, among other things. So why don't you, why don't so, you say what, what the, the element of your analysis is that deals with that? I, you know, again, if we're looking for wisdom from sacred stories and you're talking about money, well, the next guy after Midas, if you're a Westerner, the next guy after Midas you have to go to is Jesus, right? I mean, there's just no... Now, I can't say that I have studied a lot of gospel in my day, but I really delved into those. It's four lines of gospel. It's an incredibly short passage, and yet it's really the climax of his ministry before mm -hmm. his crucifixion. And what you learn is that it was this deed that convinced, and now I'm going to use my language, that convinced the kleptocratic network of the day that they had to kill the guy. He was and a if you look at <laughs> the progression of his ministry, it's really interesting. First, you get love thy neighbor. Mm. Now, there's a thread that runs through all of this, which is that the great revolution that Homo sapiens committed on the primate order was egalitarianism. Primates are not egalitarian, they are hierarchical. Mm. We overturned that and stayed egalitarian for about 150 or, two, or 200,000 years when we were hunter-gatherers. And I've read into a lot of the work that primatologists and anthropologists have done about this, and they've looked at, at how and what, or why and how. And the why is the kind of decision to move to largely a protein diet, to, to hunting as the main source of, of staple for our forebears. Well, you can't hunt mastodons alone, <laughs> you know? You can't hunt saber-toothed tigers, you know, off on your own in, or in a family. You have to band together. And we were already social as primates. And so how do you keep the hunting band together? You share out the meat equally. Mm -hmm. That ancient, 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 foundation stone of homo sapiens radical egalitarianism is the also pie, at, it's sorry? interesting the the pie that was being hunted was big enough that not one person could eat it anyway you know, that's you, correct that's a you great take these big animals and you have a whole bunch of people that that take it down they have to share because it would go to waste anyway right uh, that's so absolutely not, right especially because you don't have a fridge <laughs> right so yeah. you got to move it. You got to move it pretty quickly. I think that's a wonderful point. 
And um, that lies at the root of so much of our ritual, breaking bread together, even the Last Supper, back to Christ, right? And there's a whole riff in here about Greek sacrifice, which turns out to be at the origin of money. So there's a there's a paradox here, which is money also can be a source of democracy, but let's not get into that right. that degree of detail. But but look at Jesus. He is talking. Oh oh, sorry. So what's important here is, of course, we do still have that hierarchical latent stuff, and we still do today, and that means dominator types and it means submissive types also you need both to have a hierarchical organization or society and so how did you keep the dominator types from dominating you had to slap them down but what these research or distract people, them sorry or distract them look over yeah, there Diana. you kind of have to punish them the dominator types you really have to rein in Mm -hmm. The people who are going to try to steal more than their share of the meat, and believe me, even with plenty of meat to go around, there are some people who have the <laughs> Midas disease, right, who are going to keep wanting more than their share. And so what these researchers found out was that a coalition would develop of everybody else. And first they gossip about it and they talk about it amongst themselves and see whether they all agreed that George, you know, he's really taken a little more than his share. And he's not really an alpha nasty guy, but he's a little bit of a sneak, you know? And so he's kind of surreptitiously stealing more than his share. We better make Sorry. him realize that, you know, we know what he's up to and it's not going to be tolerated. So that's, and that's the only way that the alpha dominators can really be reined in is by a cross-cutting coalition of egalitarians, not just a faction. Well, by Jesus's day, you've got a society that is sick on the Midas disease, has developed the networks of corruption that Midas disease always leads to, and the general population is divided up into all these different factions, right? That's love thy neighbor. Love thy neighbor is really about let's reconstitute the coalition of regular people across all of our identity divides. And how does he do it? He brings them together by sharing meat, loaves yeah. and fishes, right? Mm -hmm. Then and only then does he go to the temple and commit the one act close to violence that Jesus is known to have committed. Right. And it's pretty dramatic. He goes up there, strides up the steps of what was a combination of the Trump Tower, Washington, D.C., um, the military base in, in you know, Qatar, Wall mm -hmm. Street, and Fort Knox. I mean, you had a bank, you had the Supreme Court, you had gold-plated walls, you had a military base. I mean, that is what he took on. And he strode up the steps of that temple, which was gold-plated. I couldn't believe it when I found that out. Um, and he throws over the tables. He waves a whip around. He doesn't actually whip anybody, but he waves mm -hmm. a whip around. It's pretty violent. So it's really fascinating. It's the most violent thing he did, and yet it's fundamentally an act of social shaming. Right. He's gathered the coalition together, and he's pointed them at, Sorry, yeah, gather the egalitarian, the 99% together across their identity divides. Then he brings them to the temple and he says, these are the meat hogs that we need to slap down. And I find this an incredibly deep lesson because number one, how he did it and how badly we're doing in the same situation. We are bitterly divided along just about every kind of identity divide you can think of, be it political, red and blue, be it black and white, or black and brown and white, be it male and female, be it immigrant and apparently non-immigrant. I mean, every place you can imagine, we got identity divides that our meat hogs are, are effectively instrumentalizing. And we are doing some social shaming. Even some powerful people were social shaming. But we're not, number one, gathering the coalition together first. And we're not really picking on the right meat. We're not picking on meat hogs 
Mm. We're picking on other powerful people, and we're also picking on a lot of not powerful people. Like who is sufficiently orthodox in their language, for example, is really getting a lot of our attention. And that's why I really feel that myth is so incredible. Myth, sacred story, is so incredibly important. And I, I mean, I'm looking at a crucifix sitting on my desk right now because I was so grateful to Jesus for helping <laughs> me understand this. You know, right? I thought it was a great point you made about the shaming uh, culture, just not getting the first step right. Yeah. Um, and I, I've, I've often thought that we had a, a, a very unfortunate cultural exchange with China recently. You know, we, we they're imitating our, our forms of capitalism and we're imitating their forms of shaming culture. Yeah. Um, and yeah. and it, 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 we're not doing the better in that exchange. Yeah. But uh, so that's the background. And uh, be, so we can get to some of the corruption before. Uh, yes, that, please. Right. Before we make a great time. analogy. Obviously, there was corruption at all times. You make that perfectly clear. But you, you focus, of course, on the things that are more recent. But you, you made a great analogy to, to uh, the Gilded Age, uh, what happened basically after the Civil War um, and, and how, how that built up, how society dealt with it and what the consequences were. And, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's not a good analogy for our future. But anyway, it's still a very yeah, uh, useful. That's exactly analogy. right. You're yeah. exactly right. So I agree with you, George, that corruption has always existed. But the point I'm trying to make here is that, in fact, Corruption as what the Supreme Court was talking about, mm -hmm. as a stray random thing done by a stray venal individual, is different from corruption as an operating system of coalitions of people sick with the Midas disease. The last time we had that was the Gilded Age. We've had some corruption throughout, but obviously. But the last time our politics and economy were fully captured, by kleptocratic networks was the Gilded Age. And I go into some examples. What I learned in doing this research was the, you know, so the examples are, I, again, I don't want to go into too many historical details, but what you had was interwoven networks of business magnates and government officials who were trading places a lot of the time. And, you know, I'm talking about everyone we know about, Rockefeller and, and, and Mellon and Carnegie, and, you know, and I come from or was at the Carnegie Endowment for International Peace, right? Yeah. They did a lot, all of these guys did a lot of work to try to launder their images. Many of them started out as out and out criminals, including JP Morgan, mm -hmm. who then founded the bank. I mean, that guy was, was a war profiteer, was selling defective rifles to the Union Army. Right. Um, Unbelievable. You know, so we've got and there were a lot of people playing around on the fringes of the criminal world and interacting with the criminal world in that period. What I think, I, I, by the way, was, I, I loved your definition of, of these guys as sociopaths who, who only have two career paths, either organized crime or, or these corruption networks and these rules. That, that was a great line, sir. Right. <laughs> Thank you. And the point is, it's it's a lot safer. And that's yeah. exactly what we're living with today. We are we are being governed by people who are objectively criminals, and they are not all to be found in one political party. But what they have all done is is make a significant effort to narrow the rules as to what constitutes ill, you know, technically illegal behavior that you can be prosecuted for, and then hamstring enforcement of those rules that remain on the books. And so that's what the Gilded Age, Gilded Age guys figured out they could do to the point that they even took the monumental post-Civil War constitutional amendment, the 14th Amendment, which was about equal protection under the laws for freed slaves. By 1902, that amendment had only been applied in law or, you know, in in court uh, with respect to freed slaves less than a dozen times mm -hmm. in every single case freed slaves had lost. That amendment had been applied hundreds of times on behalf of corporations and corporations won. So corporations obtained equal protection of the laws with human beings and that's the Midas disease, right? That is converting a precious value to something inanimate. 
And that was how the networks were able to bend the rules to yeah. serve their purposes rather than the public's. You take the rule and it looks like one thing and you, you leave it, its image there and you use it for some other purpose altogether. You, you, you mentioned in your book that Mark Twain wrote The Gilded Age with uh, Dudley Warner, but uh, he also said, there's only one native criminal class in America, it's Congress. Well, I would say Congress, when it is in the thrall of, it, it's not just Congress, it's Congress no, no, it's together not, yeah. with these business magnates. And that's exactly what we're experiencing today. And Con experiencing Congress again. and executive branch that is fully intermingled with business magnates. And so that was a situation and it got us devastating not only working conditions and 12 hour days and child labor and terrible health and indentured servants instead of farmers and you name it. It also led to, and this was a discovery for me. I had the great depression in my mind. Everyone knows about the great depression. What I didn't know was there was a financial meltdown that led to a significant depression just about once every decade. Yeah. from the beginning of the Gilded Age, from 1873, right to the Great Depression. So then I looked, as you said, I kind of applied this as a pattern, and I said, golly gee, uh, let's look at us. If we're living in a similar situation of network corruption, well, what's our landscape look like? And sure enough, we have the, we have the savings and loan crisis, which was the result of systemic fraud in the savings and loan industry, which was both corrupt and corrupting because it also corrupted the accounting, the appraisals, real estate agents, you name it, was getting corrupted by that whole scam. We got dot-com, which is a very similar scam where you set something up that is attractive in order to sell stock. You make the money on the stock and then you bail out before all of the people who bought your stock get screwed because your company never really existed. I mean, you it didn't do about, anything about, useful. About uh, Humbert, uh, the Lisa Humbert, I think. Or yeah, Therese Humbert. France yeah. did the same so thing. So that yeah. was an astonishing story. Thank you. That's a Gilded Age yeah. version. I just asked a friend of mine in France, you know, golly gee, did you guys have a Gilded Age, basically? And the guy's <laughs> hair stands on end and says, are you kidding? That was the crazy money time. It was, yeah. it, it's called the beautiful era. And that's, again, how we gloss over things in retrospect, right? Mm -hmm. And so he pulls that down this little book, tiny little book, about the, you know, scam artist of the century. It's about a woman who basically had such a gift of gab that she could persuade people to give her whatever she wanted. And she wormed her way into marrying the daughter of a senior political person, so she developed a whole kleptocratic mm -hmm. network. She was friends with the head of the Justice Department, the head of the police, with the, the, I think it was the prime minister or the president of the Republic for a while. The, you know, whatever she had. And then all the jewelers in town and all of the business people. And she had these salons and on and on. And it was all, it was basically a Ponzi scheme. Yeah. What it was all based on was she had this safe. And she said, inside my safe is an inheritance. And believe me, I can pay back your loan. She even put out a bond issue on her own personal lifestyle. I mean, that's exactly like the Federal Reserve and the bond issues that we're watching in the COVID crisis, right? You've got companies all over the place that are putting out bond issues. And because we have to save the markets, you have the Federal Reserve printing money. Except it doesn't have to. It can make zeros, you know, because now we're electronic. The Federal right. Reserve is making billions of zeros. And with that, it is buying bonds that whose collateral is essentially what it turned out in the case of Zambert was that in her safe, when they finally did arrest her um, decades into this scam, they found an old newspaper and a button. Yeah. That was the basis of both savings and loan and dot com. They both you know the were... Before we go, promising future. It was also Enron. Enron. It was the Enron so, scam. Uh, the savings and loan uh, crisis. There's one detail that's not in your book about that. Yeah. On, on what what drove it? And uh, I happened to to uh, do uh, analysis uh, with the early computers for real estate at the time uh, before I went to law school. How interesting. And and there was a new law in 1981 when Reagan came in, a tax law called accelerated cost recovery. 
And under accelerated cost recovery, you could, you could write off the cost of the 25 years of the value of your building in the first five years. There you go. And, and, and it was put in place, and it was very not talked about, but the first year, about $50 million were invested in that kind of thing. Because, you could, you, because of the way things were structured at the time, you could then get 100% you know, value right. loans from the SNLs, right. and right. you could basically use your tax write-off to pay for your entire investment in something. It had tax consequences down the line, but what happened was very interesting. $50 million went into it in 81 when it was passed. Five hundred million. Um, the numbers are, are estimates, but about that. Five hundred million used that the next year. Uh, Ten billion used it the next That's year. That's it. And and a hundred billion used it the next year, and then they took it away. Um, but before they took it away, most of the people who who, who invested at the beginning had already sold their investments That's exactly in real right. estate, so they were so, out. So, so obviously somebody knew what was going on, and 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 got in. But that little theft. It reminds me of a, a friend of mine. Uh, tells the story about a boy breaking into his car uh, on the streets of New York. And he caught him. He was like a 10-year-old boy. And he, he smashed the, the window uh, with, with a rock, went in there, and, said, well, and he said, well, what are you doing? He says, well, I want that candy on the front seat. And that's, he, he, he broke the window to get the candy. And it reminded me of almost all corruption, almost all uh, these things at the high scale. There's no, no paying attention to the millions of dollars of damage that you're doing, you get your candy. You, you get your five cents or 10 cents worth of candy. And as long as you walk away with that, you don't care what the consequences are. And that's your, your stories are, are replete with that. Uh, the savings and loan was a, was a great example. Um, there's a, there's a, so what one. your example on savings and loan brings up that I think is incredibly important, I'm so glad you gave us that, is number one, that was one of a whole series of Reagan era quote unquote reforms right. that almost incentivized systemic fraud. So that's right. one really important thing. And I missed that one and I right. thank you for adding it. The second point that you raise is that these things are done in the arcane details mm -hmm. of legislation and even regulations and even the guidance on how regulations ought to be implemented. So they're very opaque to ordinary American citizens. And I get into that in a different context. I get into that in the EPA, but it's right. a really important thing. And that goes back to your question about secrecy and obfuscation, because the more you can bury this stuff in the technical details that no one can wrap their minds around, the easier it is to get away with it. I thought it was very interesting, the, the, the details. I don't know why the media did this, but that one Hillary Clinton issue about the pork belly futures and uh, that, that she was supposedly got $100,000 uh, from Tyson this way. A scandal that, that while well, Bill was president and she was the first lady. And the interesting thing was the media always said, this can't be explained. But it's, it's a very simple transaction. You know, two people bid on pork belly futures Opposite bids. At the end of the day, the the bid is uh, is um, closed, and it doesn't make any difference. You just close out one. One loses, the other one wins, and so the money transfers. And it, it's it, there's so many ways. And and if and if the uh, laws are changed to try to stop the process, there's just so many other new ways or other ways that will be figured out for for changing money in ways that will look just fine. Okay, George, but. What I would urge you to be careful about is, okay, maybe that particular example is one that should not have been hit upon by the media. However, the way that the Clintons built and instrumentalized an interwoven network, frankly, of public officials and business magnates is exactly the kind of thing I'm talking about. And I don't want to yeah. try to get into the, you know, get into or, or imply a, a quote unquote false equivalency. But I also want us to be very careful about all of us having 2020 vision when it comes to corrupt practices and personnel on the other side of the aisle and somehow getting fuzzy vision <laughs> when we're looking at people on our side of the aisle. One, so one, maybe yeah. you're right that that example was not the right thing to focus on. But if you look at Tyson 
and how Tyson treats chicken farmers. Oh yeah. And how it has instrumentalized public public its proximity to public power, and it got there via Clinton. I think that it's a, it was a great example. I didn't mean it as a bad example. I meant it as uh, I was wondering why the media was not able to explain it in ten seconds like I just did. They, they I kept, see. I they see. Kept I see. Saying, this is too complicated to explain, and therefore I see. there there I is see. no problem here. Look someplace else. But it really was very simple, um, and uh, it, it it's just yeah. The, I thought you did first of all. You did a great job of being non a bipartisan or nonpartisan about this because um, there's as you say the networks are all connected with each other. The, the Clintons and the Trumps are collect, connected with each other. I mean they they they've known each other for a long time, and um, I just think. You know, we'll, we'll get to some big issues in a little while, but there's a couple other stories. Well, well, uh, then to let tell me just amend the before you move on, George. Let me then yeah. just amend because, to be honest, your voice dropped out a little bit when you were giving that example. Uh -huh. So I miss I mistook the example. Okay. Just if everyone listening can apply the comment that I just directed at George instead yeah. of directing it at George, please direct <laughs> it to the at the media. Because George and I were on the same page with that, and it's because his audio dropped out that I made. That oh, okay, great, thank, thank you. <laughs> but it's it's fascinating what happens and how the, the those, as you said, the networks are connected, and also the destruction that takes place. Now, en Enron is another good example that you you, you give. Uh, ironically, what I found in dealing with large corporations was that large corporations follow the law a little more often than other people do, not because they're better, but because the middle managers all have their own um, careers in mind. Now, this may keep changing over time. I'm talking about the 80s and 90s, so it, maybe fewer and fewer people have been interested. But because the middle managers don't want their careers shot down because of some bad behavior, a large number of them behave according to the law. But Enron was a, a total uh, outlier. I mean, the, the bosses and Everybody that they brought in, or, uh, except for a couple that they forgot to met, uh, forgot to vet properly, who, who eventually told on them. Uh, they, we, I ran into them uh, in a deal once, and they just did it in such a strange way. It immediately was clear it wasn't corrupt or anything. They just had such a strange corporate culture. I won't mm -hmm. go into the details, but mm -hmm. I asked uh, my bosses, and I said, "Who are these people? And and does anybody know the bosses? And are they legitimate?" And they said, "No, we don't think so." It was it was years before the crash, Definitely. and and uh, I do say one of the things that you mentioned about about this is it used to be that big law firms in New York uh, would turn down all kinds of people and say we're not going to work for you. That stopped. That stopped in the late '80s, early '90s, right on the time frame that you're talking exactly. about. Exactly. It used to be that they were very proud of turning down anybody that was not legitimate. Uh, I won't go into any of the details, but it, it it nearly disappeared in five years. And it disappeared because of one law firm, which I won't name. They set a different way of going about it. And they were starting to steal all the partners that were really good from the other old line law firms. Um, just like Goldman Sachs started to steal. You mentioned that Goldman Sachs had a bid for the Ivy Leaguers. And it was their bidding for the Ivy Leaguers that made all the big law firms have to increase the prices for their young associates for the same reason. The whole thing is, as you, as you mentioned, it's just in so many different institutions, just keeps barreling on. Um, so, so may one I of the things I wanted to there. talk about with you uh, in, in detail was corruption is as a part of our society. Um, that is, what percentage do you accept? What percentage Okay, I don't like do percentages and stuff like that, but here's what I, because yeah. it's really more to do with what, do, it's not a quantity thing, it's a quality thing. Yeah. It's Good. qualitative. It's one. So, so if you take this network analogy and understand that the role of people in the network who hold public office is to bend and distort the agencies and institutions that they're running mm -hmm. in order to make them serve the network rather than serving the people. And when they can't so bend and distort them to cripple them, hollow them out, sabotage them. Mm -hmm. When you have corrupt networks that are doing that, you're in trouble. So it's, as I say, not quite a numbers thing. It's a where are they situated in society? Yeah, that's, um, that's a great so distinction. What I would like to do then is say that, go back to the Gilded Age point, 
which is the next thing I asked about the Gilded Age was how the heck did they get out of it? Because as you say, I then noticed that we start going down the Gilded Age road again, approximately in the mid 1980s, as you say. I mean, the first stage is Midas disease. And then by the time you hit the, the 90s, you're into the reconstitution of, of kleptocratic networks in the United States. So there's a ton of things that's actually really interesting and can therefore be instructive to us. What happened to give us that hiatus of approximately 40 years, roughly? I mean, none of this turns on a dime, right? So I'm saying roughly. What ended it? And that was an extremely sobering lesson that I learned because thanks to Sebastian, as you pointed out, I took a very deep dive in some diff very different ways than he did. But in the protest and resistance movements of the late 19th and early 20th centuries, and I look at three, one is the massive and very, um, I want to say, persistent labor movement because working mm -hmm. conditions were just off the charts. And just to dwell on that for a second, I live in the state of West Virginia. We're back to Gilded Age conditions. We're back to 12-hour day. We're back to... Mm -hmm. No set schedule. We're at back to no unions. We're back to not quite child labor, but you know, I mean, it is. And what was so interesting is the these struggles were in terms of the material things like wages and hour. But, well, wages. Let's let's stop there. And child labor. They were also adamant about, for example, equal pay for equal work. I and mean, that is in all of their platforms back to the end of the 19th, back to the 1870s, 1880s. You also had a very strong focus on um, the eight-hour day. And what I found really interesting about how it was framed was it wasn't just about we want less work. It was in order to be a well-rounded human being, you need work, you need rest, and then you need other activities, often creative activities, like writing, reading, and, and, and putting on dramatic performances or music, what have you. So you have the labor movement. You had some very um, imaginative um, political experiments. You had something I really didn't know much about, and it's, again, my ignorance, is the Farmers' Alliance which was a rural reform movement uh, led by people who were stuck in this position that they could only borrow money from the local store, and so they were getting exorbitant interest rates. They were having to mortgage their crops as collateral, and they were getting basically screwed, excuse my language. Mm. And so they came up with all kinds of different workarounds that kept failing. What I was, again, very struck by is these were people living out on the frontier. They had no internet. They didn't even have, you know, a telephone. And yet they built sort of counter networks. They gathered in their public schools. Thanks to the U.S. mail, they had their own newspapers all over the place. Hundreds, a couple hundred newspapers were supporting this movement. And they had traveling lecturers that would talk about everything from whether how you ought to silage your, you know, your um, manure for next year's fertilizer to um, the gold standard and whether that was working for them to what the international wholesale market for their crop. I mean, it was incredibly sophisticated and incredibly broad ranging history, technology, philosophy, farming techniques. And that educational program was the root of their protest movement, which wound up creating the Populist Party, uh, which has since been maligned. Now we all think populism is about, you know, just tribal anger. That, that's not what it was. It was the opposite of that. It's, it's been turned into a slur, which was not what it was. These well. movements went on for 70 years years. These guys, the, the Farmers Alliance also came up incidentally with directional, direct election of senators. They came up with paper money as opposed to a fixed gold standard mm -hmm. and several other sophisticated reforms that were in fact enacted, but decades later. And that's what troubled me. During the 70 years of protest, nothing happened. No well, results. 
it, it's ironic. I mean, we, obviously, there's so much corruption in history and, and in America that, that we can't cover uh, too much of the detail in, in our time. And I have a couple of questions from the audience that want to okay. be asked. Um, but it, it's interesting that the Populist Party uses as an example of what can be done to push back is exactly the same group of people, the same voters that a that, uh, current president aims at and, and gets on his side. And it's uh, interesting because in some ways, he, he uses their language, um, but it's an, uh, un, an interesting person to be in the leadership role. Well, right, because when people are disappointed often enough and when a real reformer from their midst doesn't arise, they become susceptible to these kinds of tactics. But the point I'm trying to make, and I, I understand that I've been rather meandering in how no, no. I've been answering your question, but the point I'm, I'm trying to make is that they... Uh, failed in their time. Mm. So what did jolt us out of the Gilded Age syndrome, which was essentially network corruption, not only in the United States, but in the constitutional monarchy of Great Britain, in the French Third Republic, and in the German Empire. So across political parties and across government systems, we had the kleptocracy syndrome uh, rampant, if you will, in charge. What broke its grip? And I have to say the conclusion I came to was very sobering. It was that it took multiple worldwide catastrophes that were largely brought on by this Midas disease infected people running the world. They brought on these repeated uh, economic crises. They helped bring on World War I, which was the first cataclysm. The Great Depression, a uh, much deeper economic meltdown than had been the case even before, and yeah. the Second World War, because the Great Depression had a lot to do with the Second World War. So you are talking what it took to jolt us out of this was two world wars, which included two genocides, mass starvation in Europe, a global pandemic that dwarfs the current one, and a, a global economic meltdown. That is the urgency of this book. What I am saying is, please, let's get this solidarity, disaster solidarity ethos going to prevent us from driving ourselves into a similar series of cataclysms, which frankly is where we're headed right now. We, we would hope that we don't need that much education before we realize that this is not in our self-interest. And it's not even in the self-interest of the people who pursue the kleptocracy, if, you, if, if they can be, if it can be explained to them. I, I think it's fairly clear that it's not in their interest either. So um, one of the questions that came is that we're talking more about systems uh, of corruption that put in place rather than particular acts. There's a lot of individual uh, stories in your book as well, uh, which we're not going to go into because of the time, uh, but they're great stories. And you have a nice different angle on a lot of them. I'm Jeffrey Epstein. You have a great angle on him. You have a great angle on people that we know that are famous for their problems uh, in, in exactly that way. Um, but this uh, corrupt network idea, I think, is extremely useful uh, for understanding it. And one of the, the second question uh, that's in from Robert Archer is, please include the post-communist transition countries in your comparative list. Oh, yes. Uh, Thank you, Robert. Sarah covers, <laughs> Sarah covers that whole uh, thing in her yeah. book excellently. So great question, Robert. Um, Thank you very much ahead, indeed. Sarah. Indeed. So, so as I start to look at what I'm calling the pattern, right, which is how do we resemble the Gilded Age, I go through some of these cataclysms that we've lived through. And one of the main ones I dwell on is the fall of the wall. Not that the fall of the wall itself was a cataclysm, but the point is that how that transpired just at the moment of kleptocracy rampant gave birth to precisely the type of network that I'm talking about in the former Soviet Union, because what you had was a kind of unholy alliance between former communist officials like President Putin uh, with new entrepreneurs who became the oligarchs, plus out now criminals. I mean, Misha Glenny has a wonderful book, which I quote from um, substantially called McMafia, which is really focused just on the criminal network side of it. But in mm. fact, these networks were all three woven together. 
And so that burst on the scene as given the way privatization happened in the former Soviet Union. And then what started to happen is they were all transnational anyway. And so they immediately, these networks may have anchor points in Moscow or, you know, Abuja or Washington, but they're all transnational, right? They're all interwoven. And so particularly if we were just to look at this former Soviet, we've all been treated to how Ukraine ties into all of this, right? That's very much part of the, you know, Yan Yanukovych was absolutely a member of Putin's network, right? So they cross all of the borders of these currently independent countries. One of the interesting ones for me was Emin Adelarov, who was the guy who, you know, was the patron of, um, I'm sorry to keep mentioning Trump because really I don't intend to, um, because I don't think this is um, isolated to him. And I think if we overfocus on Trump, those of us who are concerned about Trump, um, we're gonna miss the point here. But what is interesting about that is that he's often been described as a, as a Russian rock star. He's the one who helped usher the Trump Tower potential business. Oh, sorry, to, to usher the Miss Universe contest mm -hmm. to Moscow. So hmm, it turns out if you scratch his surface, you discover he's actually an Azerbaijani. Mm -hmm. He is the former son-in-law of the current kleptocratic ruler of Azerbaijan, Ilham Aliyev, whose wife is now his vice president and whose children, who himself and his children own basically the entire financial industry. They own 11 banks between them. Mm -hmm. So they are almost my platonic ideal of a kleptocratic network. <laughs> and you find that this is the guy who's hooked into Donald Trump and therefore also hooked in to Vladimir Putin. And so this is precisely the kind of thing we're talking about. And now what you have, and I would also strongly recommend that folks read um, Luke Harding's recent book called Shadow State. Mm -hmm. This guy, he's a British, he's a, the former Guardian uh, Moscow correspondent who knows more about how kleptocratic networks work in Russia than anybody else I know, apart from maybe Janine. No, he knows the most. And this book really is looking in particular about the kind of KGB side of that network. But what he's focusing on is the deliberate instrumentalizing of corrupt personnel and practices. The, or if you again use another metaphor, it's throwing grappling hooks onto our decks, right? That is what Putin is doing with these guys. And he's doing it all over the place. I think that Donald Trump was one example. I think that, you know, I mean, Leonid Blavatnik is absolutely, uh, he's one of these oligarchs who has gotten himself laundered and he's a US and UK citizen. He just gave a gig gigantic donation to the Council on Foreign Relations. I'm a mm -hmm. former member and with a group of folks who are very concerned about this, we said, why are you taking donations from this guy? This is exactly how he insinuates himself into our system. Right. And Putin is very effectively making use of this on both sides of the aisle. Um, and this is a form, again, to use another metaphor that is from my Afghanistan past, this is a form of asymmetric warfare that we are totally, almost entirely blind to. So if you think about our, our stance with regard to Moscow during the Cold War, I mean, we had every single shield up, we were bristling with MX missiles aiming at, at the Soviet Union. Now we are being profoundly infiltrated by the very same personnel, except they're doing it in such a different way that we're almost, you know, welcoming it because it's money and we're all addicted right. to money. We're all, we're all getting involved. Um, we we're running out of time, but I wanted to cover a couple of things before we go. One, I wanted to compliment you on this statement about Jeffrey Epstein, and, and I just thought it was just excellent. You said, he used a deft combination of ego stroking and cash, which works just as well on Harvard professors as on teenage girls. I mean, I, I, I think you, you just captured why he made his way into so many different things, and it's, you know, it's an amazing story. Uh, we won't go there. 
any further than that. But uh, Gary Landsman asked a question about uh, whether you, you talk in your book about common uh, ways that we were trying to stop corruption in America, and she does cover that. But I wanted to end with a big question, um, and that is, so it, we don't have the numbers or anything like that, but let's just estimate that of all human institutions, government, business, everything, for the last 5,000 years, 95% seem to have been run pretty much similarly to the mafia. You know, if, if you just look at how everything has been run, and this is, in, in a way, we have a system that produces a, a tremendous amount of energy. I, I think of capitalism sometimes as just having lucked out in that its, its secret sauce that made it work was that it unleashed the ener uh, aggressive competitive energies of the men and took it away from military conquest and, and, and moved it into economic activity, which shifted the way the medieval times are from our times. And although I'm totally on your page about corruption, I wonder if the human races, um, and, if, and if we put in, in, in place a very strong, fair system uh, whether that everyone would find that a little too boring and, and wouldn't produce as much. Um, and I wonder, wonder what you think. About, I'm, I'm all in favor of trying. I've got a lot of ideas myself, and, and uh, Sarah has a lot of ideas in her book about how, how to change the way the system works to make it a fairer game. But, but I wonder if you've thought about that, you know, because uh, it, it, it seems like, it seems like are, we, are we like trying to get rid of prostitution or trying to get, can you minimize the problem? I'm all in favor of, but can you actually undo this if this is what people all flock to because people people so, like bonnie and clyde so wait a know. second George. i get your question and and i'd like to say one thing before i launch into it is for everyone who is giving us the honor of listening to us you can get in touch with me i have a website which is my mm -hmm. first name and last name sarah chase all together dot org it's that simple there's a contact page there's a contact button i will answer every email i get so if we have left some of your questions unanswered, we apologize, but please don't forget them. Just go home tonight and send me an email. Um, on this, here's what I have to say, George. We had capitalism between 1940 and 1980, and we produced way more. You know, more people were producing, maybe some people thought it was boring. But most people didn't. We're now looking back at that time as a pretty positive period in our history. Now, right. I think there's some issues because, frankly, we completely neglected the earth. So most of the wealth that we were sharing was extracted from the earth without really uh, considering, as you put it earlier, very, very um, beautifully with your kid example, your kid thief right. example. We were not considering the consequences. But let's just think about something else. We as a species existed in, a, in an incredibly sustainable way for 150,000 years. Mm. I mean, we probably had something to do with the extinction of the megafauna, but it looks like we learned enough from that experience to be a little more careful about how we were using our resources because that is very much part of the ethos of indigenous peoples. Now, a lot of people can say that was primitive and it was unsophisticated and it didn't make any big cities and it didn't make any monuments, and that's true. Mm -hmm. But I'm not entirely sure that that means it was an inferior level of sophistication. And I certainly don't think it was any boringer. I think that, yeah. it turns, <laughs> no, you know, it was not boringer. And it survival. turns out that, number one, Cooperation turns out to be a really interesting thing to get involved in when you manage it right. Number two, there are ways, again, genetically, we are programmed to be violent. You, you males, and it's not like females aren't ever violent. They sure are. But it is true that more violence tends to be perpetrated by males than females. But what's really interesting is it's mostly between the ages of about 16 and about 30. Mm. It's a specific age group. And so what other societies had was ways of channeling that violence. And so you had hunting parties and you had war bands. And it turns out the war bands didn't do a lot of killing. They did some, but not like we are now. 
Mm-hmm. If you are another really fascinating book that provides some insight about all this is a book called um, it's a terrible title called Radical Hope. And it's about the last chief of the Crow Indians, whose name was mm-hmm. Plenty Coup. And it really goes into the tradition of counting coup. If I killed you, George, without counting coup on you, I wouldn't get a lot of respect. The way to get respect was I had to count coup first, which meant mm-hmm. I had to touch you with a non, either with my hand or with a nonviolent instrument, with a stick before I could commit violence against you. Well, believe me, getting into that kind of proximity lowers the death rate considerably, as we all know from our drone warfare. And so I actually think, once again, I hope people don't think I'm completely off the wall, but I actually think we have a lot to learn from our, you know, quote-unquote primitive forebears. And what I have to say about capitalism is it all depends on the rules. It's just a system, it's, it's, it's a construct, it's a human construct. And we made different rules. It wasn't that we were differently constituted between 1938 and 1980. It's because, I mean, I think we had been through so many disasters that our ethos had shifted to a more egalitarian and solidarity-focused ethos, and that allowed for some significant reforms. What I'm asking for us to, it changes to the rules. What I'm asking us for now is please, please let us recover that ethos and start working to force those reforms upon our society before we go through the calamities. And as George pointed out, I've got a large compendium of them uh, in the epilogue to On Corruption in America. And in a way, I'm glad that I didn't give away the punchline about the Hydra. So you yeah, have to okay. read the book we'll <laughs> to find out what's important about where the Hydra lived. I, I, I didn't want to get there either. It was, it's, a great, it's a great reversal. So um, first of all, thank you very much, Sarah, for a great uh, conversation about uh, corruption in America. And uh, it's a shame uh, that it has uh, made strong inroads here. It's, uh, as you said, between the 40s and the 80s, there were a lot of people shaped by disastrous experiences, but seemed to know what was important and what was not so important. Therefore, seemed to know what was important. Right. And we we don't want to have to go through that. Can we learn without going through those kind of disasters, what's important, what's not important? It's interesting. This COVID thing is showing everybody that we actually can cut down on certain, uh, you know, consumption, certain use of oil, all, all that kind of stuff and do it in a slightly different way. But but I think we're just getting started with democracy. We're only a couple of hundred years into it, you know, and, and I, I think we, we haven't really figured out that, that the kings aren't in charge anymore um, and that we actually can make the rules our way and, and create a, a more egalitarian society, as you said. Uh, and. I think we, we need to do a lot more thinking about it. One thing, uh, it, you had that great chart uh, about the top 1% and the uh, bottom 50% and how, how their, their share of the economy crosses over at 15 uh, at a certain point. And I, I looked at it carefully and it was very interesting because even during the depression, the 1% was able to get back after a dip, was able to get back their, their higher share. Um, and I wonder whether the 40s, the 80s, weren't good for America because we, a bigger portion of our population was part of the 1% of the world because we were on top of the world and we were, we were producing. And part of the spillover from America in the t- terrible times has helped other countries. So uh, I just think if we all think about it more carefully, uh, we're going to get through this and figure out uh, what's in our self-interest. And uh, I think it's going to be right in long line with your epilogue suggestions. So thank you again very much. And uh, so ends another event in the Commonwealth Club's 118 years of enlightened discussion. Thanks, Sarah. Thank you. See you again next time. Thank you so much, George and the whole team. Yeah, that was a lot of fun.